I'm Deathpool. Today I'll be showing you how to recreate the look of the PS1 using Godot. This has become an increasingly popular art style over the last few years, especially for indie games. This is a demo scene I've created with the effect we'll be making. There's four main things we'll need to achieve this final result. First, downscaling. Second, color quantization and dithering. Third, vertex snapping. And fourth, affine texture mapping. I'll explain each of these as we go along. And of course, there'll be timestamps in the description for each of these effects. To start out though, we need to change some of Godot's default project settings. This is a new Godot project I just created with a basic crate that I modeled in Blender. Go to Project, Project Settings, under Window, we want to change the viewport width and height to something more reasonable. I'll set it to 1280 by 960. Notice how this isn't a 16 by 9 resolution. That's because the PS1 used a 4 by 3 aspect ratio. Next, we'll scroll down to stretch mode and change it to viewport. Before we can view the next setting, we have to go up here and press advanced settings. Now we want to go to shading, enable force vertex shading. This will force all meshes to be shaded by their vertices. Here's an example of a sphere with and without vertex shading. Until the recent Godot 4.4 release, enabling the setting didn't do anything, but now it should be working as expected. Then go to anti-aliasing. Disable the screen space roughness limiter. We'll be adding a pixelation filter later on, and anti-aliasing will just mess things up. That's all the settings changed, but there's something else we want to do while we're in this menu. Go to Globals, Shader Globals. We want to create some global uniforms that we'll use later. The first global we'll create is a vector 2 called Resolution. By default, I'll set it to 320 by 240. The PS1 supports a range of resolutions, with the most popular being 320 by 240 and 640 by 480 so I'd recommend picking one of these for your game. The second global we'll create is a float called Color Depth. By default, I'll set this to 32. There's a couple different color depths common in PS1 games. If you want to go for a 15-bit style, as was common in most 3D games for the system, then you want to set this to 32. But if you want to get the full range of what the PS1 is capable of, then you want to set this to 256. You could pick almost any number in between and still get a nice looking effect however. For all of these settings to apply, when you go back to General, go down here and press Save and Reset to restart the engine. With all of the settings changed, we can move on to creating the actual effect. First, we're going to downscale the viewport with the Screen Space Shader. Create a new Mesh Instance 3D. I'll rename mine to Screen Quad. And assign it a new Quad Mesh. We want it to be a 2x2 Quad. Enable Flip Faces, scroll down to Geometry, and raise Extra Call Margin to as high as it can go. This will make sure the quad is always rendered. The mesh is now ready to have a shader applied. Give it a new shader material and a new spatial shader to go along with it. I'll name mine PostProcessing.gd Shader. The first thing we want to add to the shader are a few render modes. Add Unshaded and Fog Disabled. What this does is it makes sure the quad isn't accidentally affected by lights or fog or anything like that. The next thing we want to do is find some variables. First, our uniforms. We need to add global uniform vec2 resolution and global uniform float color depth. This allows us to access the shader globals we defined earlier in our project settings. The final thing we need to find before we get to actually writing shader code is this uniform sampler 2D screen texture colon Hint screen texture and filter nearest. The screen texture allows us to get the color of each pixel on the screen. Next, let's write the vertex shader. Position equals vec4 vertex.xy 1 1. This is quite simple. All the vertex shader does is map the quad mesh directly onto the front of the camera, filling the screen completely. Next, the fragment shader. For now, we'll just make it copy the screen texture to albedo. Albedo equals texture, screen texture, screen UV, dot RGB. As you can see, it's effectively as if the quad is transparent, just copying the screen underneath it. The next thing we need to do is downscale the image. The idea behind downscaling is fairly simple. Let's consider this image of a cube. These UVs on the left map onto the texture on the right. As I drag my mouse around, we can see how they're mapped one to one. So let's take the UVs and multiply them by our desired resolution. For this example, I'm just going to go with 32 by 32. We then round each UV coordinate down to the nearest integer, which effectively pixelates it along the X and Y axis. 
Then we need to divide it back down to be between 0 and 1, which basically zooms it back in so that it maps correctly onto the screen. Now, as I move my mouse around, we're skipping over parts of the image as we cross between the different pixels or regions of the UVs. If we redraw the image with only these pixels, we get our desired result, a 32 by 32 copy of our original scene. Again, as I drag my mouse around, you can see that we're getting the center of each pixel. So let's get this into shader code. Before we set our albedo, create a new vec2 called UV. We'll set it equal to screen UV multiplied by resolution. Then we'll floor it, which effectively just means rounding it down to the nearest integer coordinates. Then we'll divide by resolution. Finally, replace the screen UV in the albedo calculation with the UV variable we just created. If everything's correct, you should get this effect, where the entire screen has been pixelated down to our desired resolution. The next effect we want to add is color quantization. This works almost the exact same way as the downscaling effect, except instead of rounding UVs, we're rounding the color values. So we take the red, green, and blue channels of each pixel, which typically range from 0 to 1, scale them up by some amount, for example by 8, round each of them down to the nearest integer, which separates each channel into these clear bands of color, and then we scale them back down to be between 0 and 1, so we can render them to the screen. Again, very similar to the downscaling effect. To implement this in our shader, let's first separate out the texture sample into a variable called color. We'll then create a new variable called quantized color that will hold the final result. Just like how we did the UVs, take color, multiply it by the desired color depth, round it to the nearest integer value, and finally divide by color depth. To see how this looks, set albedo equal to quantized color. As you can see, everything on the screen has been effectively broken down into these separate chunks of color. I'm actually going to increase the brightness of my light a little bit, because this effect tends to make stuff look a little too dark. We're super close to being finished with the post-processing shader. The final thing we need to add is dithering. It is a key part of recreating the look of the PS1. First, let's define a uniform to control the amount of dithering on the screen. It is going to be a float ranging from 0 to 1. By default, I'd say it should be about 0 0.5. Before we actually implement dithering, we should talk about what technique we'll be using. For this shader, I'll be using ordered dithering. The idea behind ordered dithering is fairly simple. We take an image and a basic repeating pattern, overlay the pattern on top of the image. Now, the magic happens when we quantize the colors. The parts of the image that weren't affected much by the quantization have relatively little dither, but the parts of the image that were very affected by the quantization have a lot of dither. For reference, this is what the quantized image would have looked like without dithering. These images both have the same amount of colors available, but the dithered image makes much better use of the colors it has. So, the important question for us is what overlay pattern should we use? Luckily, people much smarter than me have pre-calculated the best versions of dither patterns. These are called Bayer matrices. I'll be using the 4x4 Bayer matrix in this shader. Just for reference, I got this off of Wikipedia, so hopefully it's correct. We have to define it first, though. If you're actively following along, feel free to pause the video to copy this into your code. I'll also have it in the description so you can copy and paste it from there. With this matrix defined, we can get into actually implementing dithering into our shader. First, we'll create an IVEC2 version of our UVs called int UV. It will be equal to the UV variable, multiplied by resolution, and then converted to an IVEC2. Next, we need to calculate the dithered color in a separate variable. So VEC3 dithered color equals color plus Bayer matrix int UV.x mod 4 int UV.y mod 4 divided by color depth and then multiplied by dither amount. The reason we're doing int uv mod 4 is so that it repeats over and over again along the image. We we'll replace the color in the quantized color calculation with a dithered color. This is the final vertex shader. Remember that you can always decrease or increase the dithering effect using the slider we created earlier. Post-processing already gets you most of the way to recreating the PS1 look, but there are a couple more important things we want to add. The next thing we're going to do is create a default shader that all of the objects in our game will use. I already have a mesh to test this on, so I'll just override the crates material. Create a new shader material and a new spatial shader to go along with it. I'll name mine defaultobject.gdshader. First, let's set the render modes. Render mode world vertex cord, specular disabled, and vertex lighting. The world vertex cords mode will let us get the vertex and world space in our vertex shader, which will simplify our code a little bit. The specular disabled mode disables specular lighting. And we had to add the vertex lighting mode because the setting we enabled earlier only applies to the default material, not to custom ones. The next thing we have to do is to find some uniforms. Global uniform vec2 resolution and 
Uniform Sampler 2D Color Texture colon Source Color Filter Nearest As mentioned before, the global uniform lets us access the global shader uniforms we defined earlier. Let's go into Uniforms and assign the mesh a color texture right now. I'll keep using the crate texture that I already had before. The first effect we'll be implementing in the object shader is Vertex Snapping, sometimes also called Vertex Wobble. This is the effect where the vertices of a mesh look like they are wobbled around as the mesh or camera moved. The way this works is pretty simple. Every vertex of every mesh is snapped or rounded to some grid. On the PS1, they were rounded to the nearest pixel, which makes the effect pretty subtle for everything except slowly moving or rotating objects. Yes, once again, we have another effect like dithering and color quantization, where we're effectively just rounding values. Because of that, the implementation is going to have some similarities to the previous effects. There's another uniform we need to define for this first. Uniform float vertex wobble, one in the range of 0.1 to 1, and by default I'll set it to 1. This uniform will allow us to get different amounts of vertex wobble. At 1, it will be hardly noticeable, but identical to how the PS1 had it. At 0.1, it will be pretty extreme. This effect will all be handled in the vertex shader. First, we're going to get the vertex position and screen space. We're using the world vertex chords render mode, so we just have to multiply vertex by view matrix and then by projection matrix. Then we're going to get the amount of snapping we're going to use. This is equal to resolution times the vertex wall uniform we created earlier. So we multiply our position by snapping, round it to the nearest integer, and then divide it by snapping. Now, we only want to do this to the x and y coordinates of position, and we'll store it in a new variable called screen position. Finally, to make the effect actually visible, let's set the position variable to a vector 4, with the first two values equal to screen position, and the second two values equal to position.zw. This is the effect. I recommend turning off shadows because they tend to look very weird with this effect on, and the PS1 didn't really have shadows anyway. Overall, the effect might be kind of subtle, especially because of how much the post-processing shader reduces detail. If we lower the vertex wobble uniform to, let's say, 0.2, then the effect is really obvious. I personally recommend keeping it as close to 1 as you can, but if you really need to lean into the effect for something, then it's worth putting it down a bit. Alright, now for the final effect of the object shader. In fact, the final effect of this video, affine texture mapping. It's easier to show what affine texture mapping is than to explain it. Here are two images of the same mesh. The left has regular mapping, and the right has affine mapping. As you can see on the left image, the squares along the left wall get thinner horizontally as they move further into the background. But on the right image, the squares remain at approximately the same width, which creates the illusion that they're actually getting larger. What's happening is that the UVs are being interpolated from left to right perfectly linearly. In reality, as the wall gets further away from us, the UVs should also get squished horizontally. By default, Godot interpolates UVs correctly, but we want to replicate the way that the PS1 interpolated textures, which is with affine mapping. Let's first define two new variables before the vertex shader. Uniform float affine mapping, which will range from 0 to 1, and by default equal 1, and varying vec2 original UV. The affine mapping uniform will let us specify how obvious we want the effect to be. At zeros, the UVs will look completely normal. At 1 though, the effect will be fully visible. The original UV varying will help us keep track of what the regular UVs of our mesh are supposed to be, so we can use it for later. In case you didn't know, a varying is something you set in the vertex shader and then can reuse in the fragment shader. At the end of our vertex shader, we want to set the original UV varying to UV. We then want to multiply UV by the Z coordinate of the view space vertex position. So UV times equals view matrix times vec4 vertex 1 dot z. We aren't actually using any texture yet. Let's define the fragment function, and for now, make it just use the original UV to sample our color texture uniform. So vec2 UV equals original UV, and albedo equals texture, color texture UV dot RGB. I've already assigned the mesh to crate texture, so it appears automatically. This is how normal UV mapping looks. To use affine mapping, we'll change the way that we defined our UV variable. So let's do mix original UV, UV divided by vertex dot Z, affine mapping. And this is what the final effect looks like. Keep in mind that most PS1 games subdivided their meshes a lot so that the effect was less noticeable unless you got really close to the mesh. If you want to make it less obvious without having to do that, then you can just lower the affine mapping slider. At zero, it's just the original UVs, and at one, it's regular affine texture mapping. Alright, back to the demo scene. This is created using the materials I made in this video, and these are the specific settings I've used in case you want to recreate it. Finally, here's what the scene looks like with the CRT effect applied over it. This uses the CRT shader I made in one of my previous videos. A link to all of the codes from this video is in the description.
If you enjoyed this video and learned something from it, feel free to like or subscribe. I also would love to hear any questions or suggestions you have in the comments. I'm DevFoodle, and I appreciate you watching this. Goodbye!